but I have it on good authority. He's named after the god of war, Nathan Mars. A round of applause. Yes, little, yes, yes, there you go. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so my name is Nathan Mars, and I'll be talking about how do you build systems that operate on very large amounts of data. By very large, I mean something on the scale of 100 terabytes or more. So a little, about, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I write a blog. Uh, I write about a lot of things. Occasionally, I write articles about big data subjects. Uh, I'm the author of a couple of open source projects in this space. One is called Cascalog, uh, has a nice user community around it, uh, and Cascalog makes it uh, easier to do big data batch processing. <clears throat> the author of another project called ElephantDB, which we open sourced uh, just about a month ago. Um, and I am the author of an upcoming book for Manning Publications that will be published next year called Big Data, Principles and Best Practices of Scalable Real-Time Data Systems. Somewhat relevant to this talk. Um, and for my day job, I'm the lead engineer at a startup in San Francisco called Backtype. So Backtype uh, creates uh, analytics tools to help marketers understand what's happening on social media. So basically, we get a lot of data. We have over 30 terabytes right now, uh, and we produce analytics on that data on real time. Uh, and just some more stats, we process over 100 million messages per day. We serve over 300 requests per second. Uh, our cluster ranges in size from 100 machines to 200 machines, uh, depending on you know, how much load we're dealing with. And we've done this all with only three full-time employees and two interns. And Backtype is built on open source. Uh, I put up here some of the projects we use. Uh, I'm sure there's a bunch that I'm missing. Um, and like, we couldn't have done what we do without leveraging so much open source. Um, and kind of one of the points of this talk is that there's no reason you can't do it too. Like, these open source projects solve the hard problems. They provide you the, the primitives you need to do big data processing. You know, the primitives for, the primitives for distributed fault tolerant computation. Right? And the key is, is to learn how do you use these tools in the right way to build these systems. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So let's start off uh, and think about data systems from a really high level. Like, I want you to forget like relational databases, forget about primary keys and foreign keys and tables um, and relations. Let's just think about what, what are you trying to build at a very high level. And at a very high level, it's actually really simple. You have a bunch of data. We'll call it raw data. That raw data is kind of just your base data. It's unaggregated. It's unnormalized data. And what you want to do is produce a bunch of, or you want, to, you want to look at that data in a bunch of different ways. And those ways you look at the data are called views. So to give a concrete example, kind of using like a back type example, like your raw data may be tweets from Twitter. Uh, and you know, just every record is just a tweet. It's just what someone said, who said it, when they said it, and any other data associated with that. And your views on that data may be, OK, for any given URL, how many times was that URL tweeted on Twitter? Another view may be, for every person, what is, you know, let's look at, let's calculate some notion of influence for every person on Twitter. And another view may be, uh, in the past 12 hours, which topics have been talked about in unusual amount? And that's called trending topics. Right, so like I said, everything else, schemas, databases, indexes, that's all implementation. It's all really important but it's implementation. It's really important to be able to understand what a data system is from this high level. Uh, so first, let me start off and talk about what are the properties that you need in a data system. Um, so let's just start on that. So the first important property is robustness. And by robustness, I mean robustness to both machine failure, so we're going to be, the only way to deal with big data is to use distributed systems. Um, so if a disk fills up or a machine blows up or load gets too high, your system should be able to recover. Because when you have so many machines, you can't help but have some machines have problems sometimes. But uh, besides machine failure, you should also be robust to human error. Because inevitably, it's impossible for you to have um, perfect code on every commit. Like sometimes you will make mistakes. You'll start writing some bad data. 
you'll deploy the wrong algorithm, and you'll corrupt some values in your database. And the system should innately have recovery mechanisms for these situations. The second is low latency reads and updates. So this one's simple, so you should be able to uh, read a view quickly, and, you should, and when you get new data, that should be reflected in your views quickly as well. Uh, scalable, obviously, so if you have an increase in data or an increase in number of requests, you should be able to handle this uh, somehow. And the way we're going to see it's handled is through what's called horizontal scalability. So just add machines, and then it'll add resources, and it'll make things um, scalable. So fourth is that uh, a system you build should be general. So it shouldn't just be specific to one kind of data pattern. It should work for a very wide variety of problems. Fifth is extensible. So if you need to add a feature or modify some existing feature you have, you shouldn't have to build an entirely new distributed system for this. It should be easy and natural to add new features or new things to your workflow. Uh, the sixth is an important one. So you should be able to do ad hoc analysis on your data. Um, so you know, if you have big data, that means you have a large, interesting data set, and there's a lot of unanticipated value within that data set. And there's a huge amount of gains you can have for your business in being able to mine that data and discover like, new business optimizations or new applications you can build on that data. So you need to be able to explore your data. The seventh is minimal maintenance. This is particularly important for us at Backtype because we only have five people. You know, maintenance is very much a tax on developers. So systems that require a lot of hand-holding, that require you digging through logs, um, you know, you don't want to spend too much time doing that. You want to focus your time on building real systems and you know, solving real customer problems. <clears throat> and finally, the last one is debuggable. So all this means is that if something goes wrong, and inevitably things do go wrong in big systems, you need to, your system needs to give you the information necessary to understand what went wrong. And basically what this comes down to is that for any value in your system, you need to be able to trace how did that value come to be. You need to be able to understand how did it get that way so you can understand what was the problem that caused it. And as we'll see, all these properties are satisfiable in a big data system. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about how you build something that satisfies these properties. So the architecture I'm going to describe contains two components. Uh, the core component is called the batch layer. And then there's a component on top of that called the speed layer. And we'll discover what these are in the upcoming slides. So let's just temporarily pretend that update latency doesn't matter. That it's OK that when you get a new piece of data, that it takes six hours for that to be reflected in your views. Right? Let's just pretend this temporarily. We'll fix this later. <clears throat> OK, so we're going to start off and, and figure out how do we implement a system that doesn't have to worry about update latency. What's the simplest way we can do it that satisfies our, our other properties? So let's start with the batch layer. Now, the batch layer is all about doing batch computation on data. It's about doing batch arbitrary computation on data. So it's high throughput, horizontally scalable computation, and it's arbitrary. You should be able to do any sort of computation you want on your data by computing things on your entire data set, no matter how big it is. So the dominant uh, tool out there for doing batch computation is called Hadoop. Uh, can I get a quick raise of hands? Uh, anyone here use Hadoop? One person. Who here knows what Hadoop is? A few more people. OK. So um, Hadoop is a pretty big open source project. Uh, it's an implementation of MapReduce. So MapReduce was originally created by Google back in the day for them to do, um, build their search engine. Um, it's not the end-all, be-all batch computation, but it's the most general. Um, and basically, I don't want to get into the specifics of how MapReduce works, but basically, um, Hadoop has two components. One is something called a distributed file system, uh, and a distributed file system works just like a normal file system, except it's spread across many machines, uh, and it's software fault tolerant. So every file is replicated multiple times, so if you lose a machine, well, you still have that data somewhere else. It's not unavailable. Um, and otherwise, it pretty much works like a normal file system. You have folders and you have files on it. Then there's something called MapReduce. So MapReduce is a computation framework built on top of the distributed file system. So the idea is that you write jobs. Um, 
you write jobs in this MapReduce way. So you, you write it in terms of this map function and this reduce function. Um, and then Hadoop will automatically parallelize that computation for you. Um, and basically, you run your MapReduce job on some set of input files. Uh, and then the MapReduce job will then produce some set of output files from, that input from those input files. And it doesn't modify those input files. It just creates an entirely new set of files. Um, so you, you get like parallelism, scalability, fault tolerance for free when you stick to the MapReduce model. <clears throat> so, okay, so on the batch layer, so you know, what are we talking about? These are things you would implement on top of something like Hadoop. Um, so on the batch layer is where we'll, where we'll store the master copy of all your data. Like literally like at back type, we have a single folder on a distributed file system that contains all of our data. You know, 30 terabytes of data spread across many files. Uh, and then the master data set is append only. So um, except for very rare cases like writing bad data, we don't delete data from that data store. We don't, we're always just appending new data. Um, so this makes it, you know, very easy to add data. You just create a new file, put a bunch of records in, and then you close the file. So on the batch layer, we're going to compute these views on that data. So we have our raw data like tweets, and then what you want to do is um, do these arbitrary computations to compute a bunch of views. Right? And all a view is is a function that takes in your entire data set as input. And what you do is you implement that function in terms of MapReduce, um, and then you get this scalable computation. Right? It'll make use, if you have 100 machines, it'll make use of 100 machines. If you have 1,000 machines, it'll make use of 1,000 machines. Right, so the idea is that you have your master data set, which is just constantly being appended to, and you compute all these batch views. Um, right, and the cool thing about batch computation is that it's arbitrary, so you can compute anything that's computable, you can compute. Um, so if that master data set is tweets, like one of our views is going to be tweet count per URL, another view will be influence scores, and then we have all the other views that we compute. 